House of Mystery presents Inside Writing, the radio show where authors discuss their writing process in all genres. You are back in the House of Mystery, and of course, I'm Al Warren at the controls again. And Mr. Michael Hawley is uh, here with me to uh, help me get through this this hour. This is going to be a hard hour. Hello, Al. That's right. It's, yeah. Uh, me, us nonfiction people. We, uh, this, this is going to be uh, very uh, intriguing for us. Yeah, it's, it's certainly interesting. So we've got quite a guest. Not only is she the founder and CEO of Inkling Press, and uh, she's also an author. So let's just uh, let's just talk. So Miss Fern Brady, thank you for being here. Well, thank you for having me. I'm I'm glad to be able to come on and chat with you guys. Nice speaking with you. Yeah. Um, wow, you've got quite the uh, thing going on. I thought I was busy, but so now you've got uh, a publishing um, company as well as you're a writer. Um, how did you get into that whole world? Like, what what led you into this uh, trap? <laughs> well, you know, I I'd always wanted to write. Um, ever since I was a kiddo, I wanted to be a writer. I made up fantastical stories all the time. But, you know, my parents were like, you know, you really need to get a sensible job, you know, one that actually pays the bill so that you can leave the house. <laughs> and <out>. so, <laughs> pretty much, right? So, so I became a teacher. I, well, I did a little bit of being a foreign correspondent, and then I became a teacher. But then I hooked up with the Houston Writers Guild. And I started attending a lot of their critique groups and just re refreshing myself in my love of writing. And I attended a conference with a lady that was self-publishing. She, you know, she was one of the beginning, um, the one of the first people I knew that was actually independently publishing herself. And she wrote this book called um, Who Does Indie Publish? What Kind of Loser Does Indie Publish? And How Can I Be One Too? And it was really, like a, it was really like a how-to manual of, of how to publish yourself. And at the time, you know, I really didn't have a book ready. You know, I was still fixing United Vidin, which is my first book, and just writing short stories here and there. And I thought, but I could be a publisher because I could run a business and, you know, and publish other people, you know. And so that's kind of where Inklings Publishing began. And uh, we and the idea was to create a publishing company where we would have a lot of anthologies, publish a lot of different authors in them, and then be able to host like writers retreats and other things and make it cost effective for writers. And uh, and that's where it all started. It was entirely her fault. <laughs> <laughs> How long ago was this? Uh, this was in 2013. 20. 2012, 2013, where I started kind of getting the idea. And then we launched our very first book in 2014, um, which was an anthology. It, the Eclectic Writing Series anthologies um, is how we started just being able to publish multiple authors and uh, promote multiple authors. And then we started hosting our annual writers retreat, which, you know, we will hopefully bring back next year. Um, it kind of got paused for COVID, but, um, but that's, yeah, 2013, 2014 is when we, we began our, our journey as a publisher. What, what gave you, um, and I say this always, uh, courage, like what gave you the courage to actually think you could do this? And, and I say that not disrespectfully. What I'm saying is, you know, there's, there's so much going on out there. There's so many big publishers and big writers and all this thing. And you, um, yourself, was there some sort of an event or something you believed in so strongly that you just did it? No, I think... What gave me the courage to do it um, kind of came from seeing the way the industry was morphing. You know, we we began to see with the with the advent of Amazon and CreateSpace that was able to give authors the opportunity to make their own books and put them out themselves without an agent, without a publisher. 
we began to see the market get very flooded with with authors who are putting their books out very eagerly without necessarily looking at what the industry standards should be and without doing you know their due diligence on getting it getting it done well um and i saw a lot of authors that really didn't really want to do that you know they didn't want to be their own business but the, you know getting through the gatekeepers to like the big publishing houses has, has always been very difficult. And so the small press, you know, gives authors an opportunity to not have to worry about being your own business, but be able to still not have to struggle so much to find a publisher. You know, we still, you know, Inklings uh, Publishing has strict things for what we look for when we get a new book, but it, it's a lot more accessible because you can send us your book. You don't need an agent. You don't need a gatekeeper. And so I really saw the way that the industry was morphing. And I really believe that what we are seeing now is a lot of smaller presses that are giving opportunities to new voices that the bigger presses are not going to take a chance on because they want something that is quickly marketable. It's going to have a very fast you know, return on investment. And the smaller press, you know, can take something a little quirkier, can take a little bit of something a little bit more risky, because, you know, maybe we find a niche, maybe we hit a little niche, a nerve that ends up being really good for us. So I think that's what really made me think I could do this. I could do this. I mean, I could run this business, I can make it work. And I can bring unique voices to the marketplace and I can make sure they're high quality. I can make sure that it still meets the industry standard for a published book. So I can help authors that way. And at the same time, you're writing yourself. Yes. And I mean, because um, I, I, do, I did publish my own short stories, of course, in different anthologies. And of course, I published my own book because, you know, we, it wasn't like I was going to write myself a rejection letter or anything. <laughs> you know? Although I did contemplate the idea of having fun with it and writing myself a rejection letter. You know, dear Fern, <laughs> your book sucks. We don't want it. No, but, but, uh, but I really did feel like there's so many authors that are eager and they want their book out there. And the small press lets you be an author without having to be your own small business. Um, and you have the support and you have the quality, you know, control that I think is very important in, in the industry because too many authors are pushing their books out without really making sure they're well edited, um, you know, without really having that, that standard. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's flooded with that. There's a lot of, uh, a lot of garbage out there. And, um, I, you know, I don't know where it's going to go. I hope, you know, um, things improve, but how do you know, this is a really, uh, that's a really difficult thing because a lot of writers are not marketers or they're not people that want to be in the process of selling the book, so to speak, mm -hmm. because that's not what they do. So you seem to do both. Do you find it a conflict in a sense? Is it, is it hard for you to kind of market your own book, for instance? Well, I think for my book, it is a little bit harder for me because being the, the head of Inklings Publishing, having, you know, we have 14 authors that are under contract with us. We have, you know, many beautiful books that we work with. I really have to be cautious and I try to be cautious about opportunities. You know, I want to take opportunities to promote myself as an author and to promote my books. But at the same time, I want to make sure that I'm always, you know, working my other books, my author's books as well. So it is a little bit harder uh, to balance it out. But I also think that all of my all of my authors know that that I am really 100 percent on their side and that we work very, very hard to promote their books and to sell their books. And so I don't, when they see me like, you know, taking an opportunity to promote myself, I don't think that they, you know, that they have an issue with it. So, but it's always a balancing act, you know, being true to them and being true to myself. It's a balancing act. And, and honestly, running a company and writing can, can in and of itself, 
you know, be, be harder because, you know, like a lot of my authors, they are publishing their books, you know, um, every, every year they have a new one. And, uh, my book two is still in the works, you know, um, book one came out in 2020 and, you know, we should have had book two the following year, but balancing work and writing, um, pushes back a lot of the writing. So, so there is that. Did COVID slow it down as well? Uh, it did. It did because, you know, we had to really shift gears. Uh, COVID made us become more aware of alternate ways of marketing, you know, alternate routes. Because we had been very, very successful up until then with the in-person events. You know, we were attending all kinds of awesome Comic-Cons and trade fairs and farmers markets and lots of amazing fun events. We were in person selling our books and we were doing really well. We weren't looking as hard into online opportunities of marketing books. Um, you know, the ebook sales were happening just sort of organically, but they weren't actively sought. And when t- uh, COVID came, everything that was in person dried up. So we had to really shift gears and we had to really rethink how we market and where we market and make better use of a lot of the online opportunities um, because we had no other choice. Right. Well, you know, Mike, you can hire him as an assistant, you know. It sounds like you need him. <laughs> oh, get, yeah. Get him yeah. <laughs> what, what are you looking for when you um, – want to publish a book like in an author are you looking for their literary skills or a story is it uh what what is it that strikes you and you you find the most important in a book well the the beginning is of course the story itself um the writing the the is it is it a good story is the writings you know engaging um and we are also trying to become a full publishing house. There are some small presses that are kind of boutique and they specialize in a particular genre. And that is not us. We are, we actually um, are widening the genres that we offer. And so that we are, we do focus on like, for example, we're looking right now a lot for like mysteries or we're looking for historic fiction because those are areas that we don't have that much to offer. And so when people, People come by wanting to buy our books. You know, there aren't any on the table. But, you know, what? so it, it does start with their writing, the writing skill and how good is the story. And then once we've made the decision on, like, which ones we kind of really like, then we interview. Then we talk to the author um, and we get a sense of, you know, their personality. Um, we get a sense of you know, who they are as a person, how do we feel with them, how comfortable they are with us, how comfortable we are with them. And, um, and we also get a sense of, you know, how open are they to, you know, working on their book, making it stronger. Um, Also, how open are they to marketing? Because we do a lot of stuff, you know, we, we do our part to market the books, but we need the author's to have a strong brand, to have a strong online presence, to be active, you know, and be willing to to be active um, in promoting themselves. And so so it it is a, a process, it is a lengthy process by the time that we pick somebody. And most important is how do we feel with this person working with them? Because we're small. So we have a very small team of people. We're going to be working very closely together. And so we want to make sure that you are a good fit, that the author is a good fit for us. How many editors do you have now in your company? So we have uh, two developmental editors that work with the content of the stories. Um, And then we have one copy editor um, that does the tightening of the mechanics and the the form the formal things, making sure the grammar and typos are taken care of. We have two proofreaders that 
go through the, the manuscript after she finishes. Um, so, so those are our kind of edit, editorial uh, department. How are you with um, political correctness? And I say that in a way as, as more as the publishing side, because um, I know I've shopped a book recently and uh, a publisher wanted it, but they wanted certain words changed <laughs> um, because they were more worried about uh, how, how it's received with, you know, political correctness. Is, is that an issue for you? Uh, no, because so I really believe that we have the First Amendment and it's freedom of expression. So the author's voice and the author's worldview that they're putting in their book, that's theirs. You know, we do not try to influence the content in that way. You know, what it, what you want to say and, and what you want to express is is you know, if we've taken your book, we're going to, we're going to run with it. We're going to make it as strong as we can. Our developmental editors really work more with making sure that the, that the content flows well, that there's no inconsistencies in character arcs or that there's no plot holes. But as far as like, what are you trying to express with your, with your book? You know, that's your voice. That is your brand. And so I don't really believe in, in silencing voices. Um, I think that people are, are, you know, capable of reading different things and making their decisions on what, how they feel about it. And, and at the end of the day, you know, books are art. And um, they will be received as any other piece of art. Some people will reject it. You know, some people will embrace it. It'll speak to them. They'll be like overwhelmed with how awesome it is. And some people will be just like, meh, you know, um, and that's, that's art. You know, it, it is intended to elicit a response from the reader and any response is the correct response. So now let's talk about your, your book that you've got out here, uh, United Vidin. So let's, how would you describe that book? So United Vidin is a science fantasy uh, story. It is the first book in Thyrene's Galactic Wall, uh, the series. And it follows the royal house of on planet Jorn. And it's really Verena's story, Queen Verena's story. And I like to consider it kind of a redemption. Book one is really a, a, a redemption story because... Verena is supposed to be the first queen of to ever sit the throne um, as an heir. And she's gone through the process of training as an heir, and she does everything. She fulfills all the requirements, and she does it well. And yet, because her father uh, is aware that there is a war brewing, he really doesn't let her take the throne. He, on, their, on the 21st birthday of the heir, the, the king is supposed to abdicate and they're supposed to rise so that the heir can benefit from having the former king as their advisor. That's how it's done there. And um, he refuses to do that because he knows if he does, she won't marry Prince Emil. And he wants her to marry him because he has a really good, strong military mind and, and he's proven himself militarily. And, but her father fails to tell her what's really happening, right? He goes off to investigate some things and, you know, leaves her to plan the wedding without really, you know, expressing to her why he's doing this. And so in her mind, she begins to believe that he always wanted Emil as king and that he he always expected her to just take Emil on. And and so she runs away. And this causes a lot of problems for her people. And when she realizes just what a horrible mistake that was, and she, she decides that she's going to try to make it right, you know, the, it costs her a lot to try to come back and reclaim her birthright, you know, and, and make it right. It, it's even, even at the end of book one, she's sort of starting to sort of regain her, her position, you know, 
but uh, she's got a, a bit of a way to go before people can really trust her. This is amazing because you, you're creating an, a whole world and then your mind is in that world. That is so intriguing how that works. <laughs> yes, it's kind of, it's been compared a lot to like Dune because um, while it's very sci-fi and there's a lot of scientific stuff, it is, you know, royal houses and there's uh, intergalactic alliance councils and, you know, a lot of like um, political quagmires, which um, I, I think I really enjoy, you know, playing with um, a lot of the geopolitical mess of our world and, you know, extrapolating it into a made up world where I can control it. Oh, you have narcissists and everything? You know, that, uh, <laughs> we have, yes, we have a few. We have a few very interesting <laughs> people in there. Yeah. You know, that's interesting. So it, it, when you do that, um, do you have some sort of a subtext or is there something that, you know, at the end of this book, uh, you know, besides the entertainment value and, and, and all that, um, is, there, is there something you want people to get out of the book? Well, I hope that the, really for me, the message of book one is that it doesn't matter how terribly you have messed up. You can come back from from a mistake you you it's not going to be easy and it's going to cost you a lot but it does you know you you should not consider yourself a failure unless you give up right unless you totally don't even try because if you try you can overcome any mistake that you've made and I think that's really the mistake the the message of of book one and uh, in some of the other books, as I'm moving forward with the series, I, I do have a lot of, of, you know, takeaways in terms of how do we manage uh, people who are different from us? Because the main uh, group that is attacking are the Gortiv. And the Gortiv are lizard uh, humanoids. And because, you know, you need to have lizard well, the Human Queen away. of England, isn't that it? <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so, the, so a lot of the book two, it deals with like, you know, how do we manage differences? How do we manage diversity? How do we manage to live with people who are not like us? And so there are some messages in, in the book in, in regards to that and in, in regards to just kind of opening our minds to how can we live in a diverse world because we are in a diverse world. And so we really do need to find a way to live together peacefully, one would hope. But, um, you know, I don't have all the answers to that. Well, I'm curious, the, uh, a lot of times I can see some of the problems are echo chambers. If someone gets their news or their source from just pretty much one area that's it. They have no idea what's else going on. Do you ever kind of connect that with any of these worlds or this your world? Yes. Actually, the book that's coming out in um, – it's going to be in pre-order in July. It's going to come out in November. Um, it's actually book one in a side series. Uh, one of the characters that is a minor character in, in the main novels is Nicomir, and he is the head of Planet Gilderont. And, you know, he's going to be really important in the mainline story for as the things develop. But I really wanted to show his his story. And um, in book one of that one, which is more of a science fantasy romance, because it's really about him falling in love. Um, I do play a lot with that in hmm. that, you know, because Nicomir is the president of Ceruzia and uh, the lady he falls in love with is an artist, an inventor of Usmerum, another nation on their planet. And her nation views his nation as evil. And so she has a preconceived idea when she meets him of who he is and what he's done. And, you know, as she gets to know him, turns out that, you know, maybe the media in her country has portrayed him for a particular reason in a certain way. That's never happened. Is no, 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 it's totally <laughs> fantasy. So that's the fantasy part. That's the right. Fantasy part. Yes. So I do. I did want to play with that because I do see that a lot in our world. 
Oh yeah. How how do you experience your character? So like, and I and I say this in a point of you take uh, Verena for instance. Um, do you do you actually um, see them or hear them or? Um, and I ask that because there's so many fiction writers that experience that and talk about it, describe it that way. They even will say, "Oh, it's they're like my children" or something like that. So, what's your take on your characters? Yes, they they are very real people in my mind, um, and and sometimes I'm I'm kind of a discovery writer. Um, there's there's writers who like to plot out every little detail before they start writing. Um, I tend to be more of a discoverer in that I just start writing the story and it sort of starts flowing, and I let them take me where they want to go. Um, we at Wondery, creators of Dr. Death, Scamfluencers, and Over My Dead Body, go deeper into complex true crime stories to give you an inside look at the facts. And now we're launching the ultimate true crime fan destination, Exhibit C. It's truly criminal. Wondery's Exhibit C gives you the detective's lens of all of the evidence, taking you step by step through the twists and turns of each true crime case. Join the Exhibit C online community to access exclusive show merchandise, member-only content, and to hear directly from top criminal and social justice experts, witnesses, and investigators as they take us beyond the evidence and into the case file. Join now by following Wondery Exhibit C on Facebook or find us on the web at WonderyExhibitC.com and listen to true crime podcasts on Wondery and Amazon Music. Exhibit C. It's truly criminal. And now once once we start revising, then I try to control them a little more because occasionally, you know, I'll be revising a scene and one of them decides to ha start having a conversation that would take the story in an entirely different direction. And I'm like, no, at this point, we're sticking to this. But um, But they do feel like, very real beings and they they do become um they do sort of take over in certain ways the the way the story goes because you sort of begin to feel who they are and what their story is i one of the editors that because my books go through developmental editing as well and um one of the editors for book one insisted that you know verena can't run away because princesses don't run away. It's wrong. I had to change the whole story because, you know, she shouldn't run away. She's not going to be likable. And I, I really, I entertained the possibility of changing the story. But then I thought, but that's what she did. She, that's how it went down. You know, I can't change the way she actually did things. And it felt like she was real. You know, like, this is, this is who she is. This is what she did. So I just made it clearer why she did it. You know, I felt like that was really what the editor was responding to is I hadn't made it clear what caused her to make that choice. I hadn't made it obvious or, or believable enough to why she would make the choice. So I just went in and really dug in clarifying this is why she did it. But I couldn't change the action because it just didn't feel right for her. I mean, you know, she feels like a very real person to me. Now, these characters, they don't take over while you're driving or something, do they? <laughs> <laughs> well. <laughs> okay. Now, now we're getting to some good stuff here. What, you know, like you have, do you have bodies in the basement or do you, you know, like what's. No, no, no. but, you, but you never know when a story is going to start flowing in your head or I like to call it percolating. Um, the, the story, the ideas, they start percolating, a scene will start forming. And so you could be driving in traffic and, and, and your mind starts thinking about the, the scene and what, what this character and that character is going to say, but, um, but then you have to like pull over and write it. You know, some that I have had to do that occasionally 
uh, where, you know, it's just really strong, like, oh, man, this is really good. And if I keep going and I get to where I'm going and then I don't write it down, I'm going to lose it. So I will have I will occasionally I mean, it's very rare. It doesn't happen often. But, you know, I will occasionally pull over and just write the scene real quick. Just write down the words that are coming because they were just really good. And you don't want to lose them because that is the problem with, with us, you know, as writers. Sometimes you just, you have that moment, you have, you know exactly what needs to be said. If you don't write it down, then, you know, when you go back to try to remember what it was, it doesn't come out as brilliantly as it apparently would have in that moment. Especially after the fourth or fifth beer uh, when I have, then I really <laughs> <forget>. <laughs> You know, Hemingway said, uh, right Write drunk, edit sober, something like that. <laughs> Isn't that his favorite, his famous line? Oh, God, that's right. <laughs> perfect, perfect. I would not recommend writing drunk. I, I think, you know, <laughs> I think it's best to write sober, too. Well, you know, uh, Michael's never been sober, so. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't me that cracked open the drink. It was you, Al. I just heard that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, blame it on me. I, I'm the supplier. Um, well, you know, it's it's interesting, but um, how do you, so? How do you um, develop this story, this world, and all this? And um, so, the idea comes to you, and you just sort of work around it. Like, it, is there a process that you go through? Well, so this world was created when I was a teacher. You know, um, as, a, as a teacher, I was an English language arts teacher, and everybody on the campus taught social studies. And, you know, I was a sixth grade teacher, so I taught social studies, and that was world cultures. And so what I uh, began to do is to kind of interweave the different subject matters. And so we talked about geographic features, and how they influence the development of world cultures. And so I would have them create a little map of a made-up planet, and we would put different uh, features on it, and we would create different uh, nations and boundaries. We'd look at, oh, well, you put a river here, so this is a good natural boundary. Is that the boundary of a nation? And, and so as we went along through the year, we would create stories um, that went with those maps. Um, we would study mythology and we would create our own mythology for the world. And we would, I always, my favorite uh, book club to do was the Knights versus Samurai and look at how two very distinct societies came up with very, very similar ideas of the ideal warrior and, and what was different about them. And we'd compare and contrast. And so then we would create stories of, you know, legends of knights and, and things for our world. So over the years being a teacher, I created many, many planets with many, many worlds and many, many stories and mythologies and stuff. So all of that became the, the tapestry of Thyrene's Galactic Wall. Um, there's like 51 planets in this, in this alliance. And so there's a lot of room to play with and uh, a lot of source material from time being with my kiddos in the classroom so that's kind of where it comes from and then and then I just pick a place pick a couple of characters and then I just let them tell me what is their story so so what's your process like can you um sit down um let, let's say there's 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 nobody home and there's nothing you know you got a clear schedule between 10 and 2 today can you just like exit off and then sit down at 10 and just turn it on and write or do you have to have the the mood going uh that's a great question because a lot of people feel like writing is sort of magical and all the stars need to align the planets have to be in the right orbit and everything has to be you know magical to to write but actually being a working writer means exactly that um you do sit down and I do have in my schedule, my writing times. And over the years, I've discovered the times of the day that work better for me, in which it's easier for me to get into the creative process. But some days you have 
the time that you have. And so I, I do, I, I sit down and go, okay, this is my writing time. I clear my mind, take a few breaths. And oftentimes I will start by rereading the last thing I wrote, you know, the last scene where the story left off. I'll reread it to kind of get myself into the flow of it. And then I'll just see, okay, where am I going next? You know, um, I do sometimes look at, okay, this is the section of the story that I have so far. Um, I know that the next section is coming and, and I have a goal. I will definitely write at least, you know, the next scene, the next full scene or the next battle in the war or, you know, a particular conversation that I know is coming. So you do have to set set your intentions and then just sit and, and do it. It's, it is a, it is a skill. And like any skill, the more you practice it, the better uh, you become at it. And you can't, you cannot, I, I mean, I guess there are some authors that are very like, oh, I just have to be in a magical mood. But I, I don't think that's a working writer. A working writer sits down and gets to it. And sometimes what comes out is really great. And sometimes it's not so great. But then that's where revision comes in. <laughs> Do you, do you ever have a block or do you ever get into that cycle where, you know, you, you just, you just, you just can't do it? Yes. Yes. There are moments when, you know, emotional things are happening in your life. You know, you have a loss in the, or you, uh, you have a very stressful moment in your life. Um, and so sometimes you can't write in your project right? In the book that you're trying to finish your goal project. But then there's other, other outlets um, that it sort of takes to. So like, you know, recently I had a bit of a time it was very difficult, a lot of emotional things going on. And so instead of writing my science fantasy, I started writing poetry. Um, just random poems would come to me, I would just sit down. So instead of in, in, during my writing times, instead of actually focusing on my book and getting the story out, I just couldn't. I just, it wasn't, it wasn't going to happen. And I was blocked. So I just started writing poetry and letting the emotions that, and the stress that was kind of on me just go away through the page, you know, because once you disperse that energy onto the page, it's gone. And, and then you can look at it and assess it and, and deal with it and move on. So it's therapeutic. It really is. It really is. Um, even even in your in your fiction project, it can be a little bit because like sometimes if you're really really angry or if you're really really sad, you can write a scene where your character is very angry or your character is very sad, and you can channel a lot of that emotion into it and just disperse the energy there. But sometimes there's things that are happening in your life that are just very deeply personal or, you know, very, very serious. And so you really need to just kind of go write either a, a quick essay or a poem or someplace, a diary entry that you could just throw it on the page, you know, read it, assess it, you know, decide what do you need to do about it, you know, because usually they're emotionally charged pieces. So, you know, is there something that you need to do with that emotion besides already just looking at it and acknowledging it? And then, and then you can move on because like, that's what I, I discovered, you know, after, after this period of just writing poetry, um, then I could come back to my project and I could, I could refresh myself in it and go. It really affects you. Like, you know, like say COVID and, and war and all the stress and anti masks and all this stuff going on and fighting and stuff. Do that, does that seep into your writing then? Oh, it does. Yes. Yes. A lot of times. And I think it does for all writers. I think that, um, it is reflected in what we write, the, the situation in our world, the fears, the uncertainties, um, it's all, it all kind of flows into it. Whether, it, whether the piece of writing is, is something that is going to end up in a public space where it's going to be published, or if it just even just ends up with us, right, in a private journal of these are the emotions I felt in this moment. 
it does come through, you know, and you are affected. And I think creatives in general maybe are even more sensitive to some of the emotional charges that come with a lot of the things that happen in our world because we're just more naturally attuned to to writing about emotions and about the human condition because all books are really about the human condition. Huh. You know, um, how do you, how do you um, deal with social media? Are you big on um, reviews and social media and Facebook and TikTok and all that stuff? And, and uh, let's say negativity as well as positivity. Well, you know, one of the things that I teach my authors and that I do myself, although occasionally I will slip, but um, is to use social media to build build people up, right? Um, you can be activist if if that is the focus of your writing. Um, but for me, you know, I mean, I write science fantasy, right? So it's it's a place for you to get a chance to explore the things that are important in our world but at the same time for you to relax and enjoy. And so for me, the social media that I do is primarily uplifting. Um, I like to do a lot of romantic quotes because I do write some romance in my books. And so I do a lot of romantic quotes. I do a lot of uplifting quotes and I love to share pictures of dragons and other assorted mythological creatures. And I like to share things from NASA the, the cool things that they're discovering and the telescope uh, pictures and what they're seeing in the universe. So for me, my social media is more about what I want to be as an author and how I, I want to interact with potential readers. I want to offer them content that will mirror what they're going to get in my books so that when they, when they, begin to follow me and they like me, then if they read my book, it'll, it'll be something that they can connect to. And of course I share a lot about my dogs because I love my dogs and, um, and cars. Cause I'm a big car lover. <laughs> How do people get a hold of you? What are your uh, social media accounts or that you like people to, to be on? Or, and do you have a um, website or anything like that? Yes, I actually have a uh, fernbrady.com which is my website as an author. And then on, I'm on Facebook as Fern Brady author. Um, there, that's my author page and Fernanda Brady is my full name. So you can find me there as well. Um, and then I do have Twitter, uh, F Brady. Um, I think it's F Brady 07. I'm not on Twitter as much, um, but I, I am on Instagram as Fern Brady and um, those are the main ones I'm on. I'm not on TikTok. Um, oh, come on. <laughs> I'm, I'm not on TikTok. I'm just going to leave it there. Yeah, get on there and start dancing and have fun. Come on. You know? Yeah, right. No, no. I, you know, I, I don't know. I don't know that I, do, I would do particularly well as a, as a video movie star. Okay. No. Oh, come on. Um, so, okay. So all that said and done, um, where do you see yourself going in the next, uh, five years? Well, hopefully, um, I will have the, the first trilogy out, uh, which is the Thyrene's Galactic Wall series, which is the opening introduction to, uh, planet Jorn and to the house of Aldivia. And then, you know, I'll be working on the Forging Wars, which is the next set, which is their children. And, um, and then I have like a whole bunch of side stories that I want to, little novellas that I want to produce. So I'm hoping that in the next five years, I get to write a lot more, get to publish my books. And also that, you know, my authors from my publishing company and I, are successful. They were selling a lot of books and that people are enjoying what they're reading, that they're, that we're having success as a publishing house as well. Do you, do you look, is there certain places you go to for inspiration and um, is there certain writers that you like, or is it music or movies and stuff? What, what do you do when you want to get sort of a fire lit? 
so I have a playlist of classical music and soundtracks that are really great because I, some people can, can write to music that has words and lyrics, but I find myself that I end up singing the songs instead of concentrating on my writing. Hmm. So, so my playlists are all, you know, instrumental pieces. And um, depending on the mood of what I need to write, I may pull out different ones. You know, um, Game of Thrones soundtrack was awesome. Uh, Lord of the Rings soundtracks are awesome. Uh, How about I Dune? love Mozart. Dune. I haven't gotten their song, the soundtrack, but it did sound good. It did sound yeah. good. I have to say. Dune's a whole and, world. Yeah. <laughs> yes. And when I'm trying to write a battle scene, like I, I will get like Alexander Nevsky's Battle on the Ice. That's a really <laughs> great one. You know, so there's some classical pieces that are really intense for certain, uh, for certain moods. So like Beethoven and Mozart are some of my favorites. So I, I'm kind of eclectic in that. So, but that is where I usually go to get inspiration. Occasionally, I'll color. I'll just start, you know, drawing something um, that is from my world and and color it and and let that inspire me sometimes. Wow, you sort of like you're like Michael there. He drinking beer out of a can and coloring. The crayons, though, I just uh, it's my old days. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm a fan of colored pencil because you know you can sort of erase it a little bit. Yeah, my wife won't let me have those because I could. I'm dangerous. I could poke somebody, so she gives me crayons. <laughs> <laughs> she knows better. So, so, do you have um, writers that are kind of your favorites, or? Oh my goodness! Well, well besides, besides Mike and I, of course you. That's you, true. That's true. Naturally, naturally. <laughs> um. So, well, my favorites are obviously you know I really love C.S. Lewis and Tolkien. Um. And I love Frank Herbert. I love um, I'm trying to remember what the gentleman's name is. He's writing a series of Predator and Alien books. Um, hmm. Oh, gosh, the name is escaping me. But he's, they're really good. Um, they're, the first book is Incursion, Predator Incursion. And it's like the Predator series, you know. Uh, right. But in books, it's very, very well done. Um, and then I also love Dean Koontz. I'm mm -hmm. a big fan of Dean Koontz. Um, his brand of, uh, you know, suspense, mystery, and really fantasy horror is is really nice. And I love how he writes dogs. I think he writes <laughs> dogs really, really well. Yeah. And then, and then the Star Wars books. You know, like um, most of them are really, really good. Um, and they, it is fun to see how they play with the uh, with the Star Wars universe in there. Oh yeah, yeah. Dean Koontz was just on the show not too long ago. Um, what um, what advice would you give to um, newer writers or writers that haven't published yet? <sighs> don't give up. You know, don't give up, and don't do it by yourself. Uh, you know, it, it does seem to be kind of an isolated profession, you know, um, the romantic, you know, version of a, of a writer is that you're away in, in a faraway place in a cabin somewhere and you're writing, but in reality, it's a team effort. Um, when I, when I write, I, I attend critique groups and you do have to find the right ones, people that are going to be constructive and not, you know, detrimental to you, but, um, get good feedback on what I wrote. Um, don't be defensive about it. You know, they're trying to help you and, and get a good editor, a good developmental editor that you can trust with your story, that they're going to tell you what it needs without wanting to change you, you know, without wanting to change your voice and, and your vision for it. Um, it is a team effort, so don't go at it alone. Get connected to the writing community and find good team team to work with you. I remember one time uh, they 
uh, someone said that I wrote really well, and I said, no, i got to blame the editor for that because, I mean, one of the comments that she made after she read it was, you uh, head, you would have you uh, head, how did that, uh, head hop too much? So mm-hmm. what I was doing, I was in too many points of view, and so she goes, you're, you're exhausting the reader. So then when I did what she said, it sounded good. I go, well, that's not me. That, she did it. <laughs> but it's a good book now. <laughs> Yes. And that's, that is even now, you know, in the, in, in other times when you see it, when you see Dune, right, when you read Dune and it can be very distracting, but the, the new trend to like go into a deeper point of view where you have, you follow one character in, in a particular chapter or scene that really allows you to develop a very rich knowledge of that character too. Mm. Yeah. Maybe it's because I love Dune. That's probably why I did it. <laughs> I mean, he does. If you read it, like, it, he really does head hop like crazy. But, it, I mean, it's a beautiful book. I love that book. Yeah, yeah. Editors are, are, are trying to make the book better. They're not, they're not being uh, vicious. It's, it's the people online that say things that are being vicious. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, and, and that's one of the things you have to be aware of, like, you know, there are editors who will try to change your story, and that's just not the editor for you, right? You need an editor that's going to help you make it stronger, not tell you what to write or what you should or shouldn't write. Um, and then when it comes to the readers, um, it's art. It's art, and there's going to be people who are not going to like it, and that's yeah. okay. Yeah, and and the research, how, how important is the research for you in doing kind of a science fiction space opera sort of thing like that yes it's intense because you have to make it really plausible um but it do i that's why it's a science fantasy (laughs) because i do uh, have a lot of fantastical elements to it but you do have to ground it in in plausibility and so um it is it is intense but i don't go too crazy with it because i'm not trying to be a hard sci-fi um, you know, I'm I'm not going to be the favorite author of of Trekkies because they they really want it to be very hard sci-fi, and I'm more of a Star Wars person. Like, let's just have space wizards. <laughs> well, there you have it. Well, it's been a, a great conversation, and we're glad you're able to come on the show. Um, we've been talking about your last book, United Vidin, as well as Inkling Press, who is the uh, publishing company you uh, run and start it. Um, our guest, Fern Brady, thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Tired of wasting time trying to decide what to watch on your streaming service? Go to our website and look for the Martino Movie Reviews. You've been listening to the House of Mystery radio show. To find out more about our guests, hosts, or shows, go to www.houseofmystery.com. Show's over for now. Was it as good for you as it was for me? Yeah. Good night. This has been a production of Something Weird Media. I'll be back. You've been listening to the House of Mystery radio show. To find out more about our guests, hosts, or shows, go to www.houseofmystery.com. Show's over for now. Was it as good for you as it was for me? Yeah. Good night. This has been a production of Something Weird Media. I'll be back.